from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's with great pleasure that I am introducing Richard Thompson, whose work I have avidly followed and enjoyed in the Washington Post. It's rather funny to be making this introduction as you're sitting right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll cue you when to blush. Richard Thompson is the creator of Richard's Poor Almanac and the seven-year-old comic strip Cul-de-Sac, which features the Otterloop family and most particularly the siblings Petey and Alice and their friends although really, Petey's only made friends recently. Um, praise is frequent and generous for cul-de-sac and for Richard Thompson. There was a wonderful profile of Richard in the Washington Post magazine recently. And in that, the Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist, Pat Oliphant, had this to say of Richard Thompson. I know he would hate to be termed a genius, but that is exactly what he is. Now you blush. More than I. Praise for cul-de-sac is also lavish and frequent. The Onion recently put together an online history of the art of the newspaper comic strip, which was not a spoof, it's a wonderful piece, and in it they chose to profile cul-de-sac as a modern descendant of the best of newspaper cartooning. In that piece, cul-de-sac was described this way. Thompson seems delighted by the world, even at its peskiest. And unlike so many modern strips populated by interchangeable stereotypes, each character in cul-de-sac is idiosyncratic and essential, enhancing a comic world that grows richer every year. Richard Thompson is also this year's recipient of the Rubin Award, which is the National Cartoonist Society equivalent of the Academy Awards. So for the, the award began. In 1946, and as this year's recipient, Richard joins the rank of other comic luminaries, such as Al Cap, Walt Kelly, Charles Schultz, Herb Locke, Will Eisner, Bill Watterson, Kerry Trudeau, and many others. Um, the characters of Cul-de-Sac are also personal favorites in our house. Um, we have three dog-eared, never-on-the-shelf cul-de-sac books. I just realized yesterday there was a fourth. I'm sure that will soon be joining. And I have to say, my being here today gives me big points with my 10 and 12-year-old daughters, so I'm gonna personally thank you for that. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Richard Thompson. Thank you, can you all hear me? That was Okay, can you all hear me now? Can you all hear me now? I'll show you stuff instead. You know, you know when I came down here, the first thing I was looking for was like pig races, because I just got, it has like a county fair kind of feel. But this is a, this is a cul-de-sac strip from, it started in the Post Magazine back in, in 2004. This one was from about 2007. This was, be, I, I did it before it was syndicated and I redid it for, for a syndication. This one pretty much sums up the strip as I think of it. That's Dad, that's Mr. Otterloop, Peter Otterloop Sr., Otterloop, Otterloop, and Alice. Can y'all read that? Says, my life intersects with Alice, it's just enough to be surreal. And mom says, hmm? Alice in Petey's room says, daddy's getting on my nerves, he's always right there. Petey says, our house is so small, if you get a better job, we could move someplace bigger. This, is, uh, this, this one is sort of encapsulates the way I think of, of life as being. It's these, um, these separate, Everyone has their own separate world, and when, where they meet, where they, their friction is the resulting humor, is where the, the laughs are. This, for years, I did a, a, um, a cartoon for the Washington Post called Richard's Poor Almanac, where they pretty much let me do whatever I wanted to, which was wonderful. They pretty much did not edit it at all, except for taste, maybe, and for language, if you know, appropriate. But they, they, would, they would edit for humor, 
my, my editor, Gene Weingarten, told me he would edit for humor, but not, never for taste. And this was, a, 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 when I, I did several of these toddler's round tables where I could take on, <coughs> take on an, a, a concept or a, a, any, any newsworthy item and put it in the mouth of four-year-olds. So I had these toddlers sitting in a round table. My symptoms include bouts of incoherence, extreme fidgetism, monster hallucinations, oops, and running in tight circles. I exhibit accelerated teething, gradual hirsutism, and episodes of drooling. Since finishing Goodnight Moon, I've been very depressed. Me, I found solace in arts and crafts. I blame this crazed, hectic dot com gerbil wheel society we live in. My symptoms are classic indications of lycanthropy. I've started smoking again. Ah, Play Doh, fresh from the can, pure as bring koozie sculpture, a haiku in dull green. I will become the Play Doh. Kids, it's dosage time. Yay! I've got a play date with Prozac. I am the Play Doh. I am the Play Doh. So this one was from back in like early 2000s. I found that writing for small children for their, for their, their voice, for their mind was very easy. Maybe because it's, it's very tangential thinking, none of it's in a straight line, none of it's really coherent. And for me, it came very easy. So uh, in, in 2003, the editor of the Post magazine, Tom Schroeder, asked me if I could do a strip about people who lived in DC. And pretty much after a year or two of thinking about it, I boiled it down to this family who lived in the suburbs, which is a family in the suburbs with children. And his comic strip is like, it's about as stale an idea as you can think of. Here's another one, Mozart effect. This is a theory that Mozart could help you learn. I'm not going to, this is fairly lengthy, so you don't need to read every single one, but I did several of these, like I said. But you didn't catch that one. Anyway, this was the first strip I did, cul-de-sac. It came out in February of 2004. He's doing the thing with the fingers. I am four. My mom drives a van of a color so neutral it's unknown to nature. Are any of you kids mine? I'm not a kid. I'm Mrs. Nora Davis, and I'm 78 years old. I'd like to go to the Safeway, please. This is, you can tell the style is somewhat, it's a lot rattier looking than the, the current strip. My dad works at the Department of Consumption, Office of Petty Frustration, room 31B. The old days of CDs. Alice, stop narrating things to strangers and put a coat on. So this came out, of, just sort of appeared in the post in 2004. And I, I didn't hear much. My, one of my neighbors said, did you do the, draw that thing with the kid who yells all the time? And I said, yeah, it's, you know, I hope it's funny. But um, my original idea of cul-de-sac was it's a suburb, but it's, it's a cul-de-sac is so enclosed, it's off by itself, it's like a backwater. It's, 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 you know, it's out of the flow of the mainstream. So all I could think was, it's this suburban community with a, a wall around it with the beltway running around. Of course, outer loop is a play on outer loop, the outer loop with the beltway being the one that's always backing up. And finally, I drew a map. That's what cul-de-sac looks like to me. There's Alice on her manhole cover. This is one of the, the early strips from 2004, from July the 4th. I have vivid memories of, of not doing this as a child, but my brother did it. The neighborhood parade that would, you know, all the bikes and the kids and the dogs. One of my favorite things is this man here sitting there with the, uh, the can of beer. And these were a joy to draw and to write, just thinking of the family. And this, this is one of my early favorites, too. 
I think it's the prettiest thing I ever did, drew. This is after a night at back, at back in school, back to school parents' night, where you get home and you find your kids are still awake. Did you go to my school? Alice goes to preschool, to Bliss Haven Preschool. Did you sit in my chair? Yep, we did. How was the babysitter? She was OK. She had black fingernails, so Pete got scared of her and hid in his room. Miss Bliss told us all about your school. Did she show you the death swing or the moaning sink? Did she tell you about the war between the guinea pig and the hermit crab? No. She, did she mention the haunted coat cubby? No, but they all said he found a hat in it with someone's head still inside. And now nobody will go near it. Hey, where's dad? He sat in the little chair too long. He's in the bed with back spasm. Did anyone tell you he's got a juice mustache? What I liked about this one so much was the acting, watching the figures just shift from position to position. Here's another one. Dill wanted to climb on the big jungle gym. Alice, are you joking? I've heard of kids getting lost on those things for years at a time. We've got one of these things in our neighborhood. And one day emerging unexpectedly from a tube slide, their bodies bent with age, telling fantastical tales of finding a lost continent in the clouds and meeting Tarzan, God, and Santa Claus. Is that a yes or a no? I thought I'd get some blowback from that, equating God and Tarzan and Santa Claus, but it's a fun. This one I'll show you how to, I'll show, eventually show you how to do it. This is what this is what the syndicated ones look like without color. I draw them in, in black and white pen and ink. On, on Bristol board, and then the syndicate kindly colors them in for me. Hi, Petey. He, 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 he. Hi, Petey. Ha, ha. Hi, he, he, he. Ha, la, 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 la. Petey sits on his bed and reads a lot. Hi, Petey. Alice, will you, t will you and your friends get out of my room? Dill. Good one, Dill. You blew our cover. Forgot which hand I had the puppet on. So this is, this is Alice and Benny and Dill. I think of them as the three main kids. Dill is kind of a moon calf, you know, one of those, those kids who thinks on levels that are not quite the same as anybody else's. He's the, he's the youngest of, of, say, four or five boys, and he kind of flies below his mother's radar. It's like he's always sticky. He's always wearing short pants in the, in the wintertime. He's like, you know, he's not too well taken care of somehow, so he kind of latches onto other families. We always had neighbors like this. This is what it looks like colored. I did a fairly nice job on that. This is the rough I sent in for it. Well, this, this is my first rough. So you can see I'm playing around with the idea. When I draw a rough, usually the first one is just for me. It's like lots of random scribbles and scratches. Then I <coughs> draw a nicer one to send to the syndicate, which is somewhat legible. You can tell at the very last moment I added something. I changed it to the last, very last balloon as I couldn't get my hand inside the stupid puppet. And I said, I forgot which hand I had to put the puppet on. That's what a, a week of roughs looks like when I'm thinking to myself. It's like, here are six strips and a, and a Sunday, which is what I have to do every week, six dailies and one Sunday. So I'm, I'm like this, they look like a, you know, a pile of Band-Aids, maybe. I try to like, plot out ideas in some rough form. I said, Alice is in Petey's room a lot, usually annoying Petey. So Petey's in Alice's room. You can be Bubsy Clown Pants. I'll be with your wife, Dolly Dump Truck. I like kids' toys, so I like to draw about them. But, but Bubsy, let's take the children out for ice cream. Watch out for volcanoes. They're everywhere. But, but the volcano is full of bubble bath. Boom, boom, boom. But stop throwing sofa cushions, you children. I'll have you arrested. The children fell into their ice cream. Let's take a bath in the volcano. Kaboom! I don't know how to prattle. Hang around Alice. She'll give you pointers. That's, this is the way I think of children as playing with toys. It's like I thought the movie's Toy Story did it well. They, they, the kids are like, they're mashing all these different toys together that don't fit. They're, you know. They're fooling around. They're... And so Petey, for years, uh, Petey has had no real milieu. He's got like some, a bunch of little kids and there's Petey. 
And Petey is like, he's an introvert. He's kind of a, he's an invert. He's, he's everything you don't want your kid to be somehow. But I like Petey. But so, so last year, I sent Petey to comic, to cartoon class for the summer, figuring he had to, he had to meet some children his own age. So here's his teacher, Mr. Spinnerack, which is a, a cartoon joke. If you, it's a comic book joke. You get a spinner rack with cartoon, comic books in it. And I don't know if you know this, but today is National Comic Book Day. So here's Dan Spinnerack. And here's new friend Andre Chang. He likes cartoons with lots of superheroes and fighting lots of supervillains. And boom. I figure he's, he's the total opposite of Petey in so many ways. But he's, as it is, an, it's sort of like an equation. It's like they, they, they like each other. They cancel each other out. They, they kind of they laugh at the same things, maybe. But he needed, he needed a big, loud friend. So I figure Andre Chang is like, he's like, he likes Jack Kirby cartoons, you know. And there's Nora Slothrop, who's the little, other little girl. She's like a, she's like a neutrino. She's kind of like, you know, shooting here and shooting there. Her rubber bands are always flying out of her hair. And there's Petey, who likes, who likes dull comic books. He likes depressing comic. He would like Chris Ware if he's older. He would like, you know a more suffering type of comic book. This is the comic book that Petey has like, Little Nero. Little Nero is a play on Little Nemo. I don't, I'm sure you've all heard of Little Nemo in Slumberland. So I set up Little Nero like 30 years ago and didn't know what to do with it until I invented Petey. He's, he's probably his only audience. So Little Nero is, is like, uh, he never goes anywhere or does anything interesting. He's reading a comic book, book about who no reading uh, uh, It's an infinite regression in the complete stasis. I think Petey likes things as they are. He likes things. He likes things stable. He doesn't like change. He doesn't like any kind of new things. So I didn't like this strip when I drew it, but I got a lot of people who did like it and feedback. There's a little boy named Kevin at Alice's preschool who she doesn't like for no real good reason except that he's got a bucket-shaped head, which seems fine with me. But, I mean, I finally figured Alice is kind of a bully. I mean, I don't think I would like her entirely if she, if she was, you know, not my child. the way I think. I think your children probably do, too. Earth of Bird behave. So Petey has to do a lot of school projects. And Alice usually helps him with it. He's done a lot of um, um, like shoebox dioramas. He sort of has the entire history of mankind in shoebox diorama form under his bed, which I figure fits for him. He likes things containerized and compartmentalized. So. I think this is true, actually, from all I've seen. <laughs> the, only thing about, the thing I like about this is it's like it's almost a pop-up. If I could if I could manage it, it would be a pop-up comic strip. So maybe I am a graphic novelist. This is Miss Bliss, who runs a preschool, who is well-meaning and well-meaning and out of her element, I think, with actual small children. This was just like last couple weeks ago. They have uh, sharing time a lot, which is pretty much just like show and tell. And Alice usually fails at it. We had one of these in our toy box when I was small. Alice has the wrong idea about things pretty often. That's Alice and Benny and bucket-headed Kevin. This one is kind of a treat. This one is not going to appear for, uh, oh, about a month, I think. So I'm, kind of, I'm skipping ahead a bit with this. This is the back of their preschool. Their preschool, as I figured, is a, uh, 
the converted body shop. So it's it's not you know it's not the most pleasant looking of buildings. It's probably just you know kind of a shed with a blacktop in back. I got this idea. A friend of mine sent me a picture of like, some toys in the, in the public sandbox. It was titled Public Toys. I thought, there are toys like this out there. You know, feral toys. the toy is sort of slowly wandering off. This was something I did for the Post back in, oh, maybe three years ago. They, they were running a uh, feature called Studio, where they had they asked artists and, and various people around DC to just draw something or present something about your studio, your workspace. My, my workspace is in my basement. It's not a very interesting room. So it's like, how do I draw? So it's, excuse me, title again, oops. Title again, Drawing a Funny Cartoon in 20 Easy Steps. Exclusive Artist uh, Tips and Pointers by the well-known educator Richard Thompson. So this, this is truly the way I think. One, think of a funny idea. This is what they call brainstorming. Usually if I can think of two unrelated things and have them combined somehow, then I've got a comic strip or a cartoon. Let me try more random. But by now you're exhausted, so. Ross Chat. When in doubt, turn to the masters. This is a shoots and ladders thing. Because to loose on a green flying pig is also a good idea. I've done this. I've done this many times. If you put quotes on it, you have better luck. This when your nerves get frayed. I truly did not know how I was going to end this when I started it. That's it for the slides. Any questions? I mean, I became a cartoonist. I decided I, I did, had no choice, really. I, most cartoonists draw when they're small children. Uh, pretty much everyone I've talked to, it, it's true. Uh, usually, you draw when you, you should be doing other things, like you know, schoolwork or playing outside. It's like it's it's sort of an obsession. Uh, I became one. I mean, I started drawing when I was small, but I took a portfolio around finally to the Washington Post in like the early 80s. That's the, the dull answer. But it took me a while to get that going. But the, um, I, I'm not sure if I have any actual good advice, really. Because it's like, I seem to have backed into everything I've done. You know, it's like syndication was an accident. And it's like, I trip over it, it's sort of in the dark, you know. But uh, 
if I, if I was not a cartoonist, I'm not sure what I would. I, when I was small, when I was like seven years old, I wanted to play the bagpipe for the uh, for the Black Watch in Scotland, but that didn't work out. So it's like, which is probably just as well because I wasn't very good. But cartoons are just what I always did. So it's, I'm still doing it. Sir. Work, how did I start working for the New Yorker? That was an accident too. I've, I've done a lot of illustration for the New Yorker, which I did not bring. I, I've done a lot of uh, mostly caricature work for them. In, in 1992, I think, I did the first, um, first drawing I ever did for the New Yorker was of um, Ross Perot. It was like one of the best drawings I ever did. It took me like 10 minutes. It, it was a rough drawing. And they said, that's great, send it. And I haven't done one quite as well since, but that was like, you know, I thought, oh, I know how to do this now. It was uh, the, the uh, art director had seen a piece of mine in some magazine at a ski resort, and uh, she clips magazines. That was like 1992. So I've got something to do for them next week, too. So it's been a while for them. I, I don't do as much freelance as I used to. But uh, is that answered? Or? Yeah, uh, a cover for the New Yorker. Yeah, yeah well, um, the cover editor is, is uh, Francoise Mouly, who's Art Spiegelman's wife. And uh, she sent me some nice emails and, and letters and stuff. I, I keep chickening out on it, because I'm, I'm not, I mean, I should, yes. But yes, I should. No, no good reason. That's the answer. There's no good reason. Laziness. Yes. Sir, that's a good question. Do I have voices for the characters in my head? Kind of, I do. There were some of them that were animated by uh, Ringtails. Ringtails is an online, uh, they do flash, fairly simple animation. They're very effective. They, they time it well and they get good voices and sound effects. They, uh, they also animate New Yorker cartoons, strangely enough. But they, uh, they did about 40, I think, cul-de-sacs. And they, they, they sent me pile, just all these files of people trying out for them, people who would do cartoon voices, I guess. And they, they picked a wonderful girl for, for Alice. And until I really heard her, I thought, you know, I haven't really got a specific voice in mind, except I knew it when I heard it. You know, it's, it's like, like when you hear the, the, the early Schultz TV specials and you hear Charlie Brown speak, it just seems right. But before then, I hadn't, you know. I do hear that they do sort of dictate to me. I, th I think any author or artist or writer of any kind, if you're working with characters, you know it's working when they, it's working well when the characters start dictating to you and they, they take the, the comic strip in directions you wouldn't expect or they, they fly off on some tangent that is better than you could have thought of. It's like somewhere in your mind is just like, you know, it's sort of like a tumor maybe. And it's like this little cartoon, but it's, you know, seems to work, and when it's working, there's nothing better. So, so yes and no. Yes. For PD? How do I think of PD? That's a good question, because it's very specific. Uh, when I, I thought of PD, I wanted a kid who was not who was not like Bart Simpson, who was, you know, maybe the total opposite of Bart Simpson, who was inverted and who sat at home and was kind of dull and had his, you know, adamant reasons for being this way. He was like the child you didn't really want to have because he was kind of com complicated and difficult, maybe. So Petey is, is, is sort of like the worst of me in the same way that Alice is also the worst of me. But uh, Petey is like, um, he's, he's, he's very boxed in, but, He's, he's not really, he thinks he is more than he actually is. When he gets out of himself, he's got like a narrow range. But when you can push him out of it, he does okay. But he, he clings to his small little fine line. It's, um, he's the most fun to, 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 to draw and to write for, just because he's, he's, not, he's, he's not an attractive child, you know. There's nothing too cute about him, but there's something kind of compelling about him, I think, which is what makes him fun to do. So, yes. Sorry. There was one there. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
How long does it take? Oh, it takes too long. Um, ideally, it would take like, from beginning to end, would take maybe two hours. The way I draw on a light box, which is a big lighted board, which has got sort of a muted light behind it. I put like a rough, I do a very, very simple, kind of messy rough. And then I draw on Bristol board, which is nice drawing paper with, with dip, you know, dip pen and in India ink, the classic way. And ideally, it would take a few hours, but usually it's like five, you know, because leave room for mistakes and for tearing up or starting over, and uh, which is why I'm, I've not made an actual deadline in maybe two years. So my syndicate is very forgiving, thankfully. There used to be a, syndicates used to have a $150 a day late fee for cartoons, for comic strips back in the days before electronic delivery, and it was either FedEx or before that even. And I've heard Bill Watterson said he, he racked up, in one week he racked up like $30,000 worth of fees when he was, he was a week late with everything. So they had to, uh, but he could afford it, of course, so he didn't like it, but, but they've, uh, they've kind of cut, cut the uh, late fees down to 15 bucks a day now, which is, can still pile up, I've found, but uh, sadly. But they, they've kind of canceled my late fees recently, which is very kind of them. So. Yes? Do you have a typical workday schedule that you keep? I'm sorry, what? A typical workday schedule that you try to keep. It's changed a bit, my typical workday schedule. I used to be a very late night drawer, and kind of an all night drawer, which is for years, like uh, when I had, uh, was doing um, non syndicated illustration work, I just sort of got used to. This rhythm of like the magazine would open if I had something to do. It, the deadline was like 11 o'clock in the morning, so I could, or FedEx was like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. But now it's, I usually get up early and start, oh, by 8 o'clock, and then get nothing done till, you know, 1 o'clock, and then start all over again, even less done. So it's, it's, it shifts, and, you know, I have little windows of opportunity kind of with, with, uh, I try to squeeze everything into them, but it's, it, it changes. Yes? Um, who are the cartoonists that you most admire? I have thousands of them. I truly do. I, I mean, for, it depends on the kind of work. If, like, for illustration work, I've always loved like, um, Ronald Searle and Edward Sorrell and all these very intricate the penmen, the ones that can do dip pen work and beautiful. Um, very stylized work, and for comic strips, which I think is really what you're asking. I remember discovering Pogo, Walt Kelly, when I was in fifth grade. Remember everything before that was, it was kind of peanuts, because Carol Schultz was so ubiquitous in the 60s. He was, you know, he was on the moon, he was on the TV, he was everywhere. And as a child, I just accepted that was the best strip in so, so many ways it is. But I think Walt Kelly's Pogo, when I sat down to think about how to do, do a comic strip when I was thinking about cul-de-sac. We read a lot of Walt Kelly, just because I always thought the most difficult thing about doing a comic strip would be to have characters that could, you know, stand on their own, that could interact and could, you know, that you would understand as characters. And once I, Walt Kelly was so very good at that. All his, his, his characterizations were kind of vaudevillian, but they were always so, so very vivid and so very good. But the, um, I'd say Walt Kelly, um, Bill Watterson, is, you know, modern ones, you know, Stefan Pastis. Going back, there's uh, George Herman, Crazy Cat. Crazy Cat's the one everyone, you know, because he put comic strips further than they could ever go, and Crazy Cat could exist in no other medium. You know, it's just, you know, some like it, some don't, but I, I do like it. I, I could go on for, for a day with this, but I probably should not just now. What do you think was the... What do you find was the most difficult part of becoming an illustrator, like getting to the position you are right now? I mean, just those first few steps, knowing what to do. I mean, I was kind of clueless when I started. It was like the hardest thing about starting out. Um, sort of knowing, no, I sort of wanted, I, what I liked about illustration, which I did for like 25 years, is I got to try a lot of different things. I did caricature and color and watercolor and oils and stuff like that. But um, I was always kind of scared of comic strips because they were so demanding. But I think the hardest thing is just 
knowing which direction to point yourself in, and knowing you know when you're doing well, and realizing what you're doing well. It's you know, it was um, I didn't know such a thing as art directors existed when I first took a portfolio around to the Washington Post. I just thought you know, maybe the photo people look at this or something, but um, it was you know, it became easier as, as you understand things, how things work. I think it's, I think it's. You know, I mean, the comic strip business these days is kind of is kind of imploding with newspapers, sadly. But I think as, as, a, as a medium, it's growing hugely. I mean, people are doing stuff that I would not imagine 15, 20 years ago. I think it's socially, probably, it's, it's better than it used to be, too. I think we're getting together more. So I don't know if that helps. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering what you thought of the Mutz uh, comic strip in the paper. I think it's lovely. I think it's one of the most beautiful things in the paper. It's Mutz is, it's like a Zen strip. You just, you let it flow over you and you, mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I owe Petra McDonald some, some uh, hugely too, so I, I'm saying nice things, but also I do like Mutz. It's, um, it's, it's not like other strips. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's obviously a throwback strip. And some, the Sunday ones especially, the Sunday ones, most Sunday strips are colored digitally um, with, you know, digitally. But Patrick McDonald does this little number system like the old days and I've seen his charts for the Sunday strips. They've got little arrows with like dozens of numbers indicating each cat from fading to blue to black to brown. It's, you know, it's frightening. So I'm impressed. Um, I'll say that your strip touches my son and me like the mutts does. Thank you. We love your strip. Nice to know. I don't work as hard as Patrick does. Anyone else? Sir. How do you keep your characters from, from getting older? You know, subconsciously, you must think, oh, it's a year on, they must be a year it's, older. It is kind of weird. I mean, I've, I've discovered this. Aging characters in a comic strip is not always, I mean, Peanuts obviously never did. Calvin never did. Um, for better, for worse, did. Gaston and Allie did. But I, I, I picked the ages four and eight for the for Alice and Petey because four is you know a difficult age and eight eight is you know he's not too sophisticated about stuff yet he still maybe believes in Santa Claus maybe he's um he's not quite out of childhood but he's you know kind of virgin but I I realize it's, it's it becomes weird when suddenly they're going back to school again in the third grade in, in preschool and it's like. How do you reintroduce? It's like you can't be too specific about, oh, this is third grade. What am I going to learn this year? And it's like the same thing I learned last year, obviously. But, you know, it's, you're kind of stunting them on purpose. It's like, you know, kind of like a bonsai tree where you clip off little pieces of them. But um, it's, it's, it's kind of cruel, you know, but it's, it's, it's for their own good. So I hope they understand. Anyway, yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm a huge fan of cul-de-sac. I think it's brilliant. Thank I you. love it. I love Alice and Petey. I read two cul-de-sacs every day, one in the post and one in my little calendar. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and I love, my favorite part is Alice's exuberance that you portray in her movement. Mm -hmm. It's just brilliant. Um, if I was going to have a question, I guess it would be, how do you ever think about ways to expand uh, more people appreciating comics, particularly yours. Mm, to get more people reading comics? Yes, especially uh, yours. I think about it all the time with no, with no clear, you know, I never reach any clear you know, realization of how to do it, but I, every comic strip artist these days for a newspaper is pretty much worried about the shrinking market, the shrinking readership. Online, it's, it's available to everyone in you know, easy form just like that. In a newspaper, it's, you know, maybe newspapers are shrinking, they're, they're not buying comics, and it was hard to do before, and it's, it's harder now. And when we get together, we all kind of look at each other and say, what now? And web, the web is obviously the answer, but no one knows quite how to monetize it, except in individual cases of, like, someone becoming popular. Like, say, Kate Beaton. Kate Beaton does a strip uh, cartoon called Harka Vagrant which I don't know if you read it, but you should. It's, it's wonderful, and she's, she somehow monetizes it, so I mean, it, it expands for her. 
and she gets like half a million hits a month, you know, to her site. To, you know, just grew out of her own, her own doodling, I think. But so that's obviously the way to go. But how do you how do you do that? As a, as a business model, it doesn't work. It's non-translatable. So it's you know, well, if we get together, that's what we cry into our beer about. It's like anybody reading their scripts? I don't know. Pardon me? Yeah. I was just thinking, I'm always disappointed that Cole de Sac isn't on uh, gocomics.com yeah. uh, and, and uh, Doonesbury is there and, and so many are. Are they making money that way? Uh, do you know? Making money off it? They, they charge a, a nominal subscription fee. They yeah, it's, we, there's some, you know, okay, small change, but, you know, it's there in some form. Okay. Me last question. I hope it's really hard. Make it a math question. We'll be here for days. How am I doing? How am I doing? Yes. How are you doing health-wise? Oh, fine. How about you? <laughs> oh no. I, so I got this Parkinson thing. Uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's two years ago, and I have a friend named uh, Chris Sparks, who started a team called the SAC, which is a money-raising thing for uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And we've gotten donations for, we're gonna have a, uh, an online auction, and a, um, this is a good point to end on, an online auction and a book published to my, my publisher of all the art, all the good art, it's all good. We got Bill Watterson did a painting of PD like out of the blue. It's like his first public art that he's let people see in you know 15 years. And, um, um, Mutz, Patrick McDonald did two beautiful watercolors. I haven't seen all the stuff, but he's got oh, 150 pieces, I think. So that's you know that's how I'm doing. I've got a lot of support, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, thank you for for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.